and public for comment. Uh, so we move on to approving last week's minutes, which aren't still in the midst of reading. So let's take a moment to finish that up. Oh, God, I'm getting all confused. What was the planning board meeting? 
last Thursday? Yes, last Thursday, okay. And there was a planning board meeting that evening. I had things going on that afternoon. I do not feel like I had time to process what, what appeared to me on first glance is a significantly different ordinance that would that, that seemed to me did not just serve as a stopgap measure, but looked like what they wanted to have as a permanent piece of legislation um, for um, for dealing with uh, large scale ground mounted solar arrays. So I um, I consulted with Todd, who didn't have time to look at it, but agreed with me that I should go to the hearing and ask for a continuation, and that's what I did. <clears throat> and uh, so I respectfully asked, um, noting how much time I had to consider this. Um, there was one other member of the public who um, joined me in that ask, and that was Dave Reitman, who is in Climate Action Now and serves on their um, forest food system and farming um, and something. Um, and that request was, um, was denied. Uh, everyone on the commission, on the board, who spoke felt that um, that it was important to move this piece forward, that there were other opportunities for the public to weigh in, including the April 8th meeting of the Legislative Com Committee of the C of City Council. And um, and they had no substantive changes to, to make to the draft. Um, it was an, a unanimous, it was not a unanimous vote in favor of it. There was one person who voted against it, Alan Burson, who had serious misgivings about, well, he felt that it was a very complex piece of legislation that required a lot of technical input. He also felt that, <clears throat> um, that uh, from the little bit of Googling he did about uh, solar arrays versus trees, that solar did a much better job of um, offsetting carbon than trees do. Um, I would love to know where he got his information. Uh, when I did a Google search, simil a similar type of Google search, I came to an article, every search every search seemed to take me to this one art article that was non-peer reviewed by someone inside the industry, uh, the solar industry, that is. So, um, that, and, and that is not, that does not at all square with <clears throat> the person um, who I take a lot of cues from, <coughs> Professor Emeritus of Talks, his name is Bill Muma who studies extensively carbon sequestration in forests and many other services that, that trees provide that also contribute to mitigation and adaptation of climate change. <clears throat> so um, anyway, where we stand is that we have the draft ordinance in front of us. I've asked everyone to please look at it carefully. Um, I have tried to solicit some um, input from uh, other people, including from Bill Luma, he did he did um, give me some feedback. Which, when this is on the agenda, I will share. Um, and uh, but I f it feel it raised further questions for me. So for me, it, it feels very hard to make sense of this in this short period of time. Anyway, so that's that's my report about going to that meeting. Um, I also one other thing about the meeting is they did, they also approved. The, um, the request by Habitat for Humanity to be waived based on the fact that they were building affordable housing that was solar ready, um, to be waived the, um, the requirement to uh, replace a whole lot of uh, trees <coughs> that they, they were taking down for the project and specifically for the solar. That was approved. <coughs> I did mention that I think that it would behoove us as a city keep track um, that I, I did say as a personal uh, uh, that, that I supported this you know the project and I supported this exemption but I also said that I think it's important that we keep track of the trees that are taken down and that we um, that they not just be sort of lost in the um, you know as as these projects unfold but that we keep a spreadsheet of them and Carolyn Mish did say that there is such a spreadsheet so mm -hmm. I'd ask which maybe, um, you know, according to her, to make sure that we're really keeping track of the, if there's a net loss as these projects unfold, that we're, we're aware of that. Because it's not in our typical public shade tree tally. Yeah. Were those trees already removed? 
You mean before the project? Began? Before the permit that they received from the planning no, commission. Do not the sequence? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question either. Was it a modification of an existing special permit? It was an amendment to an existing special permit. Yes, that's why I had it on the planning board. That's how the order was read. Um, it was a lot of trees. There were, what, 16 significant? Uh, yeah, uh, I had to take one. Yeah. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. 16 significant trees. And there, there were, and, and remember when I give you this number, it doesn't really reflect the number of inches, but there were 40, 30 some, 31 inches of trees tree removed. Remember that <laughs> an inch is not an inch. Mm -hmm. Oh, an inch tree is not the same thing as adding an inch to a 20 inch tree. Um, so um, there, there was a lot of biomass lost in that. And I think it's really important that we, uh, we are aware that that is happening on any kind of um, conversion project and that we keep the city aware of that. So it's roof mounted? That one was roof yeah. mounted? So it's over? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, on a, on, on a habitat for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the amount of the amount of DVH of trees that was going to have to be re the amount that was have to be replaced was two hundred and six point five. The the waiver they received knocked that down to ninety two point five. If I'm doing the math correct, I don't have that in front of me, but that's the email that I have from Carolyn because they, I think um, Habitat uh, is going to probably do s replace seventy one and a half. 46 and a half to 71 and a half inches of replacement trees for those 92.5 inches and the rest will be paid potentially into the tree fund. So it's going to be a mix and match of the payment and also planting with uh, habitat volunteers. And excuse all of the other parts of it. Yes, that's so the, the, the 92.5 is the half of the DBH that is left after this the amendment to the special permit was given. Um, I think that's it for my chair report. Where is that property located? Glendale Road. Oh. It's across uh, from gate two at the landfill. There's a couple of, uh, one building lot, and then there's another building, multiple, four building lots, and that's where. Part of the no. And all that no. Stuff? no. That, oh, that's all. Yeah. Uh, it's, on, yeah. it's on the agenda. It's on the agenda. So can I just circle back oh, to this ordinance? Do we? Mm -hmm. Are we going to talk about that yeah. later? Yeah, it's on the agenda. Okay, I'll wait sure. for that. Now. Yeah, we're dedicated right. 25 minutes okay. to it. Okay, I just so. had a question, so I can yeah. wait. Um, let's see, so, my turn. So I had a, since the last meeting that we had, I, we had to, we had a public shade tree hearing. Um, and that was in regards to uh, the culvert being replaced on Park Hill Road. There presently is a 21 inch diameter culvert being replaced with a eight by eight foot culvert. Wow. So just imagine the difference in size. Mm -hmm. So there were five trees that were not identified on the construction plan that were in the public right away, and, and I happened to follow up with a trench permit that was there, and realized that there was five five trees, and so we had to post them. There's no there's no way they're going to build a culvert without removal of the trees. It's impossible. So we had the public shade tree hearing uh, yesterday, and there was there were no objections. The project is uh, actually being funded by Eversource um, and being constructed by Borges Construction, and it's being monitored by the City Engineering Department. And so there will be uh, replacement trees planted in Park Hill Road area. And where and the amount to be determined is going to be up to myself and Aerosource. I'm going to try to uh, get as many trees as I possibly can. What are the size of the trees? Um, they are uh, a three and a half inch and a four and a half inch American beech, mm -hmm. a five and a seven inch sugar maple, and an 11 inch scrub elm. There were some other trees that were there that were not, they were, they were almost virtually dead, so I can't really count those. So there were some smaller ones, a little inch and a half. So, but Is the culvert replacement justified? Yes. Yeah. yeah, the culvert's antiquated. It's 
being designed for, I guess, the 50 year or 100 year storm event. Mm -hmm. Plus, it also has to be that large because they want to be able to have migratory animals be able to go through it. Right. So, what does Eversource have to do with the culvert, though? It's a really good question. I think Eversource, uh, it's one of their feel good projects. Oh. It's funded by them. Oh, I see. I don't really know why there's ever source is not even. And ever source is, is, is no, not, it's not our, our utility. No. Okay. No. Oh, ever source yeah. though is a huge. I'd have to say in my experience with the Mass Tree Wards and Foresters Association, and uh, the ever source is a huge supporter of 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 regreening mm -hmm. uh, cities infrastructure. They're very supportive. Uh, very different feeling from them than National Grid. There's a, there's a lot more public outreach. They have their act together. Uh, Paul Sellers, who is uh, he's the chairman, uh, the chairman, I'm sorry, the chairperson or president of the Mastery Awards and Forest Association for the next two years, is an Air Resource employee. So he's wow. yeah. So it's pretty. It's the connection there is really deep, but it's a really. I feel it's a positive win-win uh, for the for the tree community to have them on board. They've, they've done a lot. Didn't Eversource do that utility arboretum? They did. Yeah. They did. Yeah, they built that and they, yeah, paid, that they cool. paid for all of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, I should say that we paid for it. Or someone paid for it. We didn't mm -hmm. necessarily, but you know what I'm getting Great um, <laughs> So I, I'm trying to think. There was something else I wanted to tell you. I think that's all I did. Oh, a uh, couple of things which they're not. Just two things. Um, I have the final, the final draft. So I took everyone's comments they made about the trifold setback document, and I incorporated them all. Alicia finished it, sent it to me, and I'm just proofreading it. So that should be good to go. And then I'm just going to print them off in my office. Um, as far as the mailer goes, the uh, every door direct mailer. Um, she also took the same comments that were from the trifold document and effectively changed the. Uh, document for the every the every door direct mailer but where there was a little bit of a glitch with paradise copies in the United States Postal Service so we're still trying to hammer that out but that's still on tap to go out and with the corrected comments that I got so, but I'll keep it posted and I think that's that's it all right we're in this little awkward place where I could make a motion to to move an agenda item forward so that we can use our 10 minutes that we have until two degrees is up. Shall I do that? Someone would make, need to make a motion, and my recommendation would be that we do Tree Northampton update. I make a motion that we do Tree Northampton update next and move um, to two degrees further into the, later into the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Update from Sue. Jay Northampton. Um, reaching out to volunteers about the um, plantings and whip giveaways. So, um, got some emails out this morning, had a little bit of time, and then I was working the rest of the day. Um, Marianne Labarge wanted me to put it on share, so perhaps after the meeting, I can tell you about Hi. what that is. I see you. Come on. And, um, getting the word out it sounds like and then subsequently I also talked to Rob and we're going to have bare root plantings I just there's 56 orders looking around there over 50 bare root trees have been ordered for our day and of course they they're vulnerable they need to get into the ground quickly um, they can't you know they're bare they need to get in there so um, we need to line up very strategically a lot of volunteers and this is all to be done right around Arbor Day and this, the day after that. It's going to be done properly. If the trees are delivered on Tuesday, then we can start planting locations that we have picked out on Wednesday, Thursday. Then Arbor Day festivities tentatively are um, right. at Cahill Apartments yeah. and the YMCA. I think we can do them in one day. Mm -hmm. So you got the stock you wanted to get? You hope to get. We'd hope to get. We right. we do have the stock, except we don't have this. We don't have the underwire stock to finish this project available to us for that particular day. Okay, yeah, yes. Question. Yeah. Sorry, Kate. Okay. Um, we have it. It's just at Amherst Nursery, and I'm not prepared to take delivery because they're going to be uh, 
small ball and burlap are not set up yet because we moved and I don't have the same facility to take everything. Yeah. So, we so will, did, did uh, you get the elms for um, for one or two? Yes. Oh, yes, we have uh, 16 elms altogether. So it's the plantings are for the bear roots are Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, or you? you no, I think Thursday we're gonna to we're gonna try to do Wednesday. So what we what we've done, and I can talk about this later on, but what we've done is we tried to just fill in a lot of holes with the, we tried to place the bare roots in places where we can actually do mass plantings. Oh, um, so we're filling in holes that we had left over from previous years, like on Elm Street, mm -hmm. the YMCA is a project, the Cahill Apartments a project. Um, and I don't have my paperwork with me in front of me. But there's uh, some work down on uh, Bridge Street. I think we're going to try to fill in a few holes on Bridge Street, possibly Bridge Road, but I have to double check because I think most of the stock we have can't handle the Bridge Road salt tolerance. Um, Maybe South Street? Any spots in South Street? South Street. South Street, we. So that's a, that's a conversation that I like to have at some point because Rob and I have noticed there's a lot of problems with the trees that are planted there. Uh, underwater? No, the other side. A lot of the larger trees that we planted in the last probably 10 years, they just don't seem to be very healthy. And I'm just, I don't really understand why. Acids? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. That's a possibility, but I, it's yeah. a con but it's a converse. I want to make sure we get the right species that's going to thrive, that's going to be large there. Mm -hmm. um, we've got 15 Kentucky coffee trees. So I have, uh, I also got a, some setback agreements as well out of these bare roots to uh, there were recent developments so they're going to go i think over there and then we have to plug in some holes on holly street that we have to finish where we started over there so we, we're kind of all over the place but we're trying to make it so it's easy to group volunteers together like we did on um in front of uh, on bridge street so we can just kind of piggyback people can pick a couple of trees with you know one group of a leader and three or four volunteers and actually do three trees in a row and then there'll be another group of people doing three trees in a row. So we're going to try to maximize our efforts to get everything in the ground in four to five days. All right. And so this is sorry. This is no, this is great. But, but. So it's a matter of we're just going to. There's some variables that are unknown. For instance, the weather in New York State um, is <coughs> from where the bare roots are shipped. But we're going to line up strong teams with leaders for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then there will be some last minute adjustments. So we're diving in deep here and a lot of work coming up. Um, Alicia's been tied up till um, through this week and she'll be helping more. But Rob has been working a tremendous amount. I understand getting ready for all this. And we'll be getting a lot of people involved. Pl I, I should have started with printing, has, printing ended about a week ago uh, because of, on account of the, the kinder weather. Mm -hmm. But um, now, of course, planting season begins. So, very excited about Arbor Day and looking forward to seeing everybody out there and getting a lot of trees in, getting people wrapped up for the planting season. If you find that you need more volunteers, Sue, uh, forward me, just send me an email and I'll forward it to um, the two list of neighborhood uh, listers I'm on. Okay, because I did this morning. I'm sure mm -hmm. you're on there. Oh, yeah, I just missed it. Okay, you mean you sent okay. me a, an email? You should be on Tree Northampton. The list, uh, email from Tree Northampton this morning. Can I forward you the the leader, the person who's head of the leaders group at the YMCA? Oh, did, oh. did I? I? I think you did. I think you did, yeah. Because that might oh. be a pool of, of, you know, you know, a group that would yeah. be a repeater to. Yeah, but to get repeats from last fall yeah, and sure. previous the prior spring, so that we have people who already understand about oh, not yeah. planting oh, trees yeah. too deeply yeah. and that they need the proper supervision. Yeah. It's yeah. easier. I oh, think sure. Through it yeah, once or twice. It. Yeah, I get it. It's yeah, a yeah. lot less work. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So we're really yeah. going to do some targeted follow up with yeah. um, those people who didn't have done it before. Yeah. We have a much broader list. It just went out to everybody to start yeah. with. Yeah. And then Rob and I are meeting this weekend to identify and make, to really individually reach out to specific leaders who have worked and make sure that they are distributed throughout those days and that they understand that it's it might move all around if, if 
they need to move it when the people come out. Yeah, so exciting, that's the big news. And of course, Alicia's been working. She has some outside projects, but she's been helping yeah, with this flyer, which is going to be really great. So that's it for Trina and Hampton. Great. Okay. So it's Nick, right? Yes. Hi, Nick. Nice to see you. Um, on, we have you all on the agenda in four minutes, and I figure we'd wait because I don't see Marty. And I, Who was going to be here? And there might be a few other people. So um, anything else? This is your chance. You have four more minutes, Sue. <laughs> four very minutes. Can I ask a question, Sue? Sure. For those of us on the commission who volunteered to help, um, we shared when we are available at our last meeting. Saturday morning. Yep. Mm. Should we wait to hear from you in terms of assignments or? For locations? Yeah. Yes. I don't have the locations okay. yet. Yeah. It's still being worked out mm -hmm. and uh, but Saturday morning there's a group of seven mm -hmm. and we'll consider you self-leading in in ways because you'll you have Molly and Lily mm -hmm. and you you're good with root balls and that too right yeah. so, and we've dealt with them <laughs> yeah yeah there, there are always there's always new things and new yeah. issues hopefully these are as beautiful as the bare roots we had in the fall they were just wonderful so let's fingers crossed. And I can use my new cell phone. Oh no, it's funny. So my, for my birthday, my, my family gave me this very nice set of Falco, um, you know, pruners. pruners. Um, and then I got an email from Amazon saying, "Well, we're we're accrediting your account for the full amount for these Falcos because they're actually counterfeit." They were oh, um, so we call, we're calling them Falcos. Falcos. <laughs> <Falcos. laughs> Wow. They work fine. I'm, you the know, those are the free. Wow. So what you got to do with those is those have to be your root pruning. Yes. And yeah. then when you get a, another, another a, the, the, the real yeah. pair, you can use those for canopy work yeah. because yeah. you don't want to mix the two if you can help it. Right. I've done that. He has a bar and he spent a lot of time yeah. sharpening yeah. before you yeah. start the yeah. Okay, is that about four minutes? It is about four minutes. I guess we'll get started. <laughs> well, my, my watch is 4.58. Um, hmm. I think if there's anything else. Three more can to me. Oh, I guess I'll just let you know, Sue, that my daughter is likely going to join our, um, our Saturday or Sunday morning planting group. So that'll be cool. So we'll have an, an even larger team. Okay, on so Sunday Sundays, you want to do we're that gonna, again? We're that is fantastic. Sunday morning thing. Yeah, um, and there will be, I mean, there rarely all of us at one time, but now there's up to one city. Perfect. So we can do more yeah. than Anybody have a truck? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. okay, I'm hearing voices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People are sending. Oh, and just, the, just to put in the hopper, like um to like on that Friday and Saturday of Arbor Day, um, Hello, you know in. I'm happy to transport. That's right. I don't see here. You know, like if we, you know what I mean? Just if we're doing fill-ins, you know, for trees, move, it's water. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, people yeah. don't necessarily have their hoses on yet. Right, right, right. So we may be the people with trucks. Yeah. May be moving some water. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I just want to say that. Thank you. That's whatever. good. Yeah, I just, I just keep a tally of my trucks yeah, yeah. in my little head. Yeah. All right. They're helpful. Yes. All right. We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is a conversation with a fabulous neighborhood group, mostly centered around the geographic region of Massasoit Street called Two Degrees. Technically, Two Degrees at Greenneighbors.org. Green <laughs> is that a FACO email address? No. Or it's, it's a, a real. It's a real. Yeah, it's a rip that we that okay. came up in our very first meeting, and it just it's we may have never bothered to change it. All right. It's well, that bad. which one of you would like to introduce what your what your a little bit about what your um, neighborhood group does, and then um, and then we can go on to the conversation about how you relate to our work um, uh, studying the, the the damage that gas leaks do to trees. 
Um, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm forgetting. Me. Uh, you're putting up your notes. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to get myself together here. Hi, can you uh, give us your name? I'm Marty Nathan. Martha Nathan. 24 Massasoit Street. And I'm with two, uh, two degrees of Green Neighbors down earth. And um, I wanted to. I have my notes from here. Yeah, I found them. Um, I wanted to first say support the Tree Commission's request for more time to study the solar array ordinance. It sounds like this is, was pushed on you very quickly, and it's a complicated issue. And I read it, uh, Lily said it to me, and I read it, and I said, whoa. <laughs> I don't, certainly, I can't say one way or another whether Green Neighbor, uh, Two Degrees would ever support, I, I'm sure we would support whatever you come out with, but this particular one, it's way too complicated to, uh, to, with that, to act on without expert advice. and so. Uh, we certainly support your asking for that. Okay, um, and I'll just tell you our gas leak story and then tell you why that fits in to our coming here. Um, who knows about the Northampton gas leak story? Who followed oh, it? Good. Okay. She tells us that <laughs> 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 we go to bed. <laughs> Uh, well, we got into it because we're a climate change group, um, and that's why we got together. I think if you think it's in 2015 that we came together, I'm, I'm really not sure. But it came out of uh, neighbors on Massasoit Street just really wanting to do something about climate change. And then we realized that there were gas leaks. And we realized that there was a site. Do you all know about it? Heat M A H E E T dash M A. Yeah, I showed everyone the site. Okay, and uh, we found, lo and behold, <laughs> gas leaks right in front of the house on which we were meeting. <laughs> so <laughs> we started to act on it, and and we in Northampton and the Springfield Climate Justice Coalition in Springfield. Uh, began petitioning to Steve Bryan of Columbia Gas to fix the leaks. And at first we were um, pushed away and, and said, oh, there's no, there's no here, here. And, um, and then we actually had a meeting and we convinced uh, Steve Bryan that there was a here, here. And he had already done enough investigation at, uh, with others to uh, find that there about two percent of the gas that is piped into Massachusetts is lost into the air, which is a pretty horrifying thing since methane is uh, 84 times as potent as a greenhouse gas for the first 20 years, and really those are the the most impo important 20 years are, uh, that we can think of in fighting climate change, and so we were both losing a precious commodity that people were, were paying for and uh, bringing about climate change. And as we found out later, this was kind of secondary here. Uh, for us, it was only later that we found out that it was going to treat. And so we fought with Steve Bryant and we got him to actually sit down at the table, which was pretty amazing, because they had been trying in Boston, mothers out front, and CEO of Columbia Gas. Yeah, I'm sorry, CEO of Columbia Gas. Um, they had been fighting with Eversource and National Grid and the other players and getting absolutely nowhere, despite massive amounts, proven massive amounts of gas leaks in the Boston area. And so the crack came with Columbia. And by January of 2000, well, no, there was a, there was a problem here. There are three grades of ga uh, gas leaks, as you probably know, and I'll be very brief on this. Uh, grade one is in an enclosed space and it's going to blow up. Okay, you fix it right away, like yesterday you fix it, and they are required to do that because they are liable 
uh, if anything goes wrong, as it did in Springfield in 2012. Grade two is close to an enclosed space, and it could become uh, an explosion, and they have to fix it within a certain amount of time. I think that's six months, okay? But, at, but the grade threes were everything else. I mean, you could be, you could have a gusher out there in, on Main Street, and that was just a grade three leak, and there was no law that said Columbia had to fix it. So what we were fighting about was the grade three leaks. And there are so many, tens of thousands of grade three leaks in the state of Massachusetts, it really became an issue for these companies that we understood. How are you going to triage them? How are you going to replace every single pipe? Well, that's a whole other question, which we won't, we won't deal with today. But what they did, they got Steve Bryant, as, yeah, Steve Bryant going, along with the research, researchers at Boston University, I think, and they created a means to identify the 8% of the leaks that were, were spouting 50% of the methane. We call them the gushers, they call them the LVLs, which are the large volume leaks, you know, that, that massive amounts of gas is escaping. And they found a quick and dirty method to identify those. You know there's a leak when you're driving, they have these trucks that drive around to detect gas, period, but you have no idea how much gas, okay? So if at a leak, you measure the area. You're trying to figure out how much volume is being leaked, but if you measure the area of gas, of ground affected by the gas, then you know that that, and it's big. If it's above 10,000 square feet, now calculate that out. That's 100 by 100. To my calculation, I lose count of the zeros, but that's what I think it is. If it's greater than 10,000 square feet, then that's a large volume leak. And then 40 by 50 is greater than 2,000 square feet. That's sort of a, a mid-level. The agreement that was made with Columbia Gas by Heat MA, and it was actually Mothers Out Front in Boston, who did the negotiating with Columbia Gas. We sort of stepped back, we fought our fight, and we stepped back and, and waited for the big guys to step up. And they came to an agreement that said that they would fix all the LVLs, the greater than 10,000 square feet, within one year, and the greater than 2,000 within two years which is really pretty amazing. That's the first time that that had ever been done. And sometimes we don't really realize what we did. This was based on our work out here in Little, little Northampton and Little Springfield, okay? So that agreement was made in January of 2017, and then in October of 2017, Mothers Out Front and Heat MA rolled it further and got Eversource and National Grid also to sign on to that agreement. And that was pretty stunning. So they have been fixing leaks ever since that time. And, uh, the, and going after the big ones. We don't know at this point how many big ones have been identified in either Northampton or Springfield, but we have, have a letter that we're gonna send out tomorrow asking them um, asking Steve Bryant, who really became our partner and is now retired oh, after Columbia. Yes, three weeks ago. I just found this out, which is one of the reasons I was late. Uh, after Columbia blew up the Merrimack Valley, I think he had had enough. And, um, <laughs> really? <laughs> Would you want that on your shoulders? Um, anyway. Have they replaced him yet? I don't know. I'm going to call down there tomorrow now that I know that. I'm going to find out who we should be sending our letter to. 
Um, anyway, we're going to ask for a detailed report for Northampton and Springfield. Um, and one of the things in that letter, which I will send to you I, as soon as both groups, both Two Degrees and, and SCJC have completely signed off on it, we make a few points. One is that literally Springfield has gone through, now has gone from 598, I think it is, um, gas leaks at the end of 2015 is now at the end of 2018 at 348 gas leaks. Okay, that sounds really good, but the bizarre thing is that during that three year time period, they actually fixed 2,000 leaks. So it's it's so sick. what is it's going on? Are, it, it's either whack-a-mole, oh, okay. <laughs> and it could be that. It, our, it, our, old, our parts yeah. are so old, it could be whack-a-mole, yeah. but it also could be consistent under-reporting. Mm. Okay, each year mm. saying that there are less mm -hmm. gas leaks oh. <laughs> than than there really are and the next year picking oh there that one's over there maybe it was there last year too but mm -hmm. anyway so we're asking for that clarification it's not nearly that bad in the city of Northampton we had 90 some odd mm -hmm. which was still pretty high for a town our size and for a town not only our size but in which at least two wards don't even have gas mm -hmm. um, but we're now now into the 40s. I think it's 47 leaks. I don't know if, if you remember the numbers. I, uh, it, we're about half of what we were, we were before. So that's really great. Um, and, and it's ongoing. <coughs> Again, that, those numbers don't tell us anything about the volume of the leaks. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's so the that's reporting the we want from Columbia Gas. How many of these that they fixed? were large volume, volume leaks, and how much gas, actually we didn't actually say it in this way, how much gas do they think they prevented from going into the air? Mm -hmm. We never asked that, that specific question. Thank you all. We should ask that. As it relates this to trees, I think, you know, Marty and I were just doing kind of back of the, of the envelope thinking about this, and we realized that even really small leaks situated close enough to the roots of trees can kill the trees. So so that although they're prioritizing the bushers, which is exactly what we want them to do, it doesn't necessarily address our concerns as keepers of the public shade tree canopy. Yeah, and one of the things Lily and I were talking about this as I was walking my dog and we were figuring it out in our heads, 50 by 40, which, and that's what they are demanded to fix. That's the smallest size that they are demanded to fix. That's the greater than 2,000 square feet. Well, if you're, what's your, the, is it the tree strip? Is that tree what? Tree belt. Tree belt, okay. Yeah. If your tree is in the tree belt here and the gas pipe is under the roadway right here, well, that you know, it's five, ten feet. You know, it could be a much, much smaller leak that's killing that tree. So we're trying to figure out, and we are, would love to give this to you to figure out, how to so start making the gas company, companies liable for plugging the tree killing leaks, not just the large volume leaks. And we were just popping thoughts uh, as uh, over the telephone. And first of all, what you have already done is great. We had this meeting with Bob Ackley um, in, in which uh, several of us, have you met Bob yet? He is a character, and you really need to bring him to the tree committee. He'll entertain you all night. Uh, he showed us that it's really simple and easy to detect A, methane, but B, no oxygen. 
which, because of methane, has displaced it in the ground around a tree. It's really simple, easy, takes seconds to do it. So as a doctor, and, and we have two medical people right here, this is a great, easy test uh, uh, for diagnosing tree death from methane. Uh, and so we need to put out the word in Northampton and Springfield, if you have dying trees and if they're on the tree belt, get the tree warden to come and his first, the first part of his protocol is to test the ground for methane. Many trees may not be in the tree belt, although those are the most susceptible because they're next to the streets with the pipes. But if you could also teach that to arborists, so if somebody has a dying tree and it's not on the tree belt, so it's not public, uh, have the arborists buy these little machines, which are not that expensive, and have, have the arborists do the diagnosis. But then make but yes, you have the diagnosis, what are you going to do with it? According to that agreement, there is no deal that Columbia Gas has to fix it. Fix it. So that's where the Tree Commission comes in. Could you put together an ordinance or something, or at least, you know, do some heavy negotiating with Columbia Gas about um, when they are called with a sick tree known due to methane, uh, would they fix it right away? And the ordinance would be a backup because it would place liability on the public utility to fix it if the tree dies. So that would be, it would be the carrot and the stick. That's, that was the further rolling out in my mind of what we were talking about. So this is just an idea that literally hatched itself this afternoon. Uh, but I think that they've done such a wonderful job in Boston of uh, getting the major volume leaks that I think we should take it a step further and protect the trees. I agree. I mean, there has been nothing like this done statewide as far as, as, far as we know. Zero done. So this would be groundbreaking and potentially a model providing um, action, regulatory action, you know, whatever, to to hold them accountable for the killing of trees. There are very few, but but definitely cases of um, property owners and municipalities being compensated for the loss of trees due to methane leaks. Um, In the a couple of notable ones were settled: Brookline, Newton, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. They were settled, so but there but there have been other actual case studies where it's been upheld in the courts that property because there already is um, regulation that says that gas companies need to um, protect from property loss in the case of you know natural gas damage, mostly explosions and things like that. But there were a couple of test cases with regard to trees, and they did win. Well, if you read section 11 of. Uh, Public chain tree worms, the Mass General Law Chapter 87. Mm -hmm. it says, whoever willfully, maliciously, or wantonly cuts, destroys, or injures a tree which is not his own, standing for any useful purpose, shall be punished by imprisonment for not more than six months and by fine, not more than $500. That's one of the, uh, the other sections of the. <laughs> the other sections of the law uh, reference cutting, etc., but that says injures. Yeah. Um, what was it said willfully? Well, it's an issue of will. Yeah. That's right. the, mm -hmm. and, and as yeah. long as these are undetected leaks, there ain't no will involved. Yeah. But if we but if they're detected, them, yes. right. and then they say no or they don't get to it, then yeah. it becomes willful. Yes, exactly. And so that's an interesting. Mm -hmm. And whether neg that, that is negligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whether negligence falls into that bailiwick. I mean, I'm, I'm just no lawyer, but that, that, I, that would seem like what we sh might want to pursue. Yeah, the, the other issue that uh, I think the larger uh, statewide national groups should pursue is this is really, uh, this is frankly negligence of DPU, who is the regulatory body supposedly charged with making sure that our quasi-public utilities uh, adhere to the law. 
and uh, I would en encourage uh, some definitely political pressure placed upon the governor who appoints most people to DPU. So to it's a State Department of Utilities. Department of Public Utilities. Public Utilities. Public Utilities. <laughs> what, what, does the, what kind of um, uh, oversight does the DPU have of this? What, what kind of resources do they even have to go out and see whether in fact the utilities are taking care of their lease? They have whatever resources the political will of the governor applies, which is probably real. <laughs> in this area, which is why we have certain, in this area, for certain, the utilities police themselves. Yeah. Everything, the DPU only in 2015 required the utilities to report the leaks. Okay, that's where HEDMA got their information. And they took it and made it into Google Maps, put them on Google Maps. Uh, but that was the first year that that ever happened. But all that information comes from the utility companies. There is no DPU person out there sniffing for leaks. <laughs> they probably haven't got one. Yeah. Oh, you know, I don't think they Did you identify yourself? I don't oh, know. Oh, Warren. Oh, to Drive. And that's why I'm really sad that Steve Bryant is retired, because what he told us was that he was going to make Northampton a demonstration project for fixing leaks. Oh, yeah. And he said that what he learned from us was that it's not only loss of life and limb and property, that it was an issue in climate change. And he said that we taught him that, and, and now did. it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. There's some but, juicy but, you know, quotes hopefully. that he said publicly. Yeah. So and I think that he represented these projects. Yeah. So I'm intrigued that it sounds as if we're talking that, that some of these cases have already been solved. That in fact this measurement technique, the simple one that you're talking so about, simple. is acceptable as in a in a court of law as a description of a problem. I think we would be testing that. Well, if it's already gone through the, through the courts and, and, and fines have been levied for gas killing trees, there is some, there's some law there that, that detects, in fact, we know that there's gas and trees are dying. I'm not quite sure what these cases okay. look like. They're old. But, They're like from the 20s and 30s. Uh, oh, really? Bob, do you remember Bob? Oh, no, kidding. Yeah. 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 yeah, but it's really, really old. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is probably testing out new technology in a legal context. Mm -hmm. Rich, um, can you remind us, where, where is the city on the decision to get one of these detection, there's a, what are they called? Uh, Bas Tabasco meter, yes, I'm going to buy it. Just haven't had the chance to order it. Okay, great. It's $1,800. No, no, I have not. Uh, <laughs> I haven't have looked. I don't have an Amazon account. Certificate of Authenticity. Yes. Huge price tag. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a pretty reasonable. Yeah. yeah. And any and and your knowledge of working with arborists in the in the region, do you, is gas leaks on their radar? So when they see a tree that had that went into sudden decline, branch you know die back, that's not one of the things they consider. It may, it, it may be, but nine times out of ten, they're not going to think about it because it's beyond the tree belt. It's on the other side of the sidewalk, what they're dealing with. They're not dealing with what's in the street. But, mm -hmm. but the pipes go underground. They do, but they don't think about it. Yeah. Um, I will almost guarantee you it's not okay. really on their radar unless there's something else. Could we street. educate them? Just put together a flyer <laughs> yes, and, and send it to them and see if and do some following around. I'm saying we, I'm, I'm really saying you guys. I'm not saying we as two degrees, because I know we don't have the capacity to do, to do that. Excuse me, your guest speaker, did he talk, uh, t did he speak of any scientific research or any fields of study where they quantified um, the lack of oxygen? And well, he shows you the lack of oxygen right there. And oximetry, which we use all the time, in medicine, that's a, that's a done deal in terms of that's testing oxygen. And what the tree dies of is not methane. It dies of lack of oxygen. Okay? And his, he sticks his little pipe down there and it shows two things. C2 
and O2. And O2 is zero and CH4 is something, you know? And, and so it's... Didn't he also describe some changes in the composition of yes. the soil, yes. fungal overgrowths and bacterial overgrowths because of the lack of oxygen that contributed right. to killing mm -hmm. the tree? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, he talked about how even when the methane goes down, you often don't see the oxygen go back up because you have the introduction of this thing he calls methanotropes. That's right. right. Um, right. Which yeah. then, more than I did. yeah, <laughs> which then, you know, uh, which are bacteria that come in that thrive in a methane-rich environment and they continue to deprive the area of oxygen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> speaking to what Rich said, I just know from a landscaping point of view, the only time it would ever come into your view is if you keep planting a tree mm -hmm. and you keep replacing it, yeah. and maybe after the third or fourth time, you're right. like, hmm, right. something's going on here. Yeah. So I, I've been in this industry a really long time, and it's, it's and just that, not... And that's years of time that's mm -hmm. lost, mm -hmm. and in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of mm -hmm. thousands of dollars yeah. in investment. Yeah. So I don't know why people aren't equipping themselves with, with these tools. Because typically, typically an arborist or a tree care company or a tree company, I'll take the care part of it, they go to someone's house and they are removing a tree they that's dead. Right. Yeah. And that's the end of it. And then the homeowner will decide whether or not they want a replacement tree or not. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. And it may be someone totally different than that tree care company that will actually tell them to replace mm -hmm. that tree. They may mm -hmm. work with us to replace the tree or they may work yeah. with some other smaller landscape firm to do a larger landscape plan that includes a tree. But typically, when tree company goes to remove a tree at a house, they come with everything, including a stump grinder, and then they leave, and that's the end of it. So this feels like it might be an opportunity for yeah, a future um, mass tree wardens, like blue bonnet meeting, when you guys have some presentations. Yep, we're always looking for, for new uh, yeah. material. To, could we? That's so would it um, be how, yeah, be helpful to get Bob here, because I think that he would, He's trying to meet with the tree warden of Springfield. Mm -hmm. Alex Sherman. Yeah. yeah. If there's any way you could rope him in too, because we really want to do this like we did before Springfield Northampton moving together uh, on whatever we do. So if there's any way we could get him up on board too and meet with Bob to talk about this as an issue, that'd be great. Yeah, I think uh, I would need some kind of an outline of what he wants to speak about, and then I would have to submit it to the executive board, to the Tree Wardens and Foresters Association, because they're the ones that decide about the material. Well, we could start. We, you know, there's a um, a neighborhood group, or at least a citizen group in Springfield, uh, the Arise for Social Justice, that has offered to host this presentation, this fall back through presentation, and has invited um, Alex Sherman, the Tree Warden. As well as, you know, when Lee, Lee from Chicopee was in the room, he seemed really interested, so I would invite the Chicopee Tree Warden as well. Um, and that would be his introduction to it. And then from there, if he is, you know, from there we could broaden it to a, a wider well, is that regional. Gonna happen? Is that a well, we're waiting, yeah, you know, uh, we were waiting to um, hear from Alex about his interest in it and his schedule, and he hasn't, he's right. not returning. And it's oh, actually sorry. with SCJC. Oh, it's not just, oh, that's the Springfield Climate Justice Coalition who, with us, negotiated with Steve Bryant to get the original leaks agreement. So they're, they're, you're a member of this case. Yeah. yeah. I'm, okay. I'm wondering if you should pick up the phone and call Alex. Mm -hmm. I think it would also uh, behoove us to think about uh, how the city wants to uh, plan for the utilization of that gizmo. <laughs> what was that again? Bascom. It's yeah, it from Bascom. Gas Century. Yeah, it's Gas Century from Bascom. Uh, and if the city is going to invest in, in that, I think it would uh, warrant the city to have a plan of action as to what the city is going to do with that data, both publicly and legally. Yeah, I mean, if if you could put out the word public, publicly mm -hmm. in the Gazette, all right, I mean, I mean, this let's not hold our breath. Yeah, let's let's not see. Yeah. Is that so, right? Yeah, it'll be kind of hard. I think what you know. So really? if I had to take the meter and I would go to a location where I suspect a tree has died from 
um, lack of oxygen in the soil, or I, I'm trying to test a location where I'm planning on planting a tree, the first thing I would do is I would call Columbia Gas to tell them there's a gas leak, and then they have to address it. That's how it works, and then they have to pull the trench permit. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of other things that happen when there's a detected gas leak. It's not mm -hmm. just they just show up and yeah. start drilling holes right. in the ground. But they if actually, you get the information first, if you have your little bascom, and you have the information that there's zero oxygen and you know 80 parts per million of uh, methane or whatever. I don't know what the numbers are. Um, that would be your own information that with which you could you, you could call Columbia Gas, but we could also keep we as in the city of Northampton could keep a record. Good. Uh, and then of course depending upon what Columbia's reaction would be, they would come and actually with their own high-powered sniffer and figure out yeah. exactly what level grade the leak is and then determine what to do with it. But that's just it. They won't do it. They, they, they will refer to now the new agreement. So it's if it's not over 2,000 square feet, they won't fix it. The tree dies. Tree. So, you, so you just... I don't know. That's good. No, I, I, I think I think that it becomes part of the part of our arsenal, for lack of a better word, to if we can compile data that says that leaky pipes, even if they aren't the LBLs, leaky pipes are killing trees, then we can move forward and trying to get some sort of state policy, city ordinance, whatever, that makes the public utilities responsible for fixing not only the large volume leaks, but the tree-killing leaks. So, so you're you guys, at, I'm sorry, go ahead. So you're, what, what would be most valuable that you see is a collection of data. Yeah. So whenever we, one of the, whenever a tree is, a tree site is tested, to collect that data and, and I think it's that compile it and then what beyond that you've really got to I think we're going to need some if we're going to do a regulation or, or an ordinance which seems to be in order from the way that you've been talking about it, otherwise you can't compel them to do anything below these 2,000 square feet thing there needs to be a fairly clear case that uh, that X um, ratio of oxygen mm -hmm. to methane is associated with X amount of leak within a certain amount of, of space. And those those space figures that you gave me sound that you talked about seem but, nuts anyway. Yeah. But you know, whatever. But that, so, so that's the state of leaks. Yeah. Can you imagine can 100 imagine, by 100? Right. But that <laughs> that kind of research somebody has to be doing. And then I'm actually wondering if there's a proactive way, Rich, of looking at this uh, associated with the Arbor Day stuff that you have been talking about. Did there be any value in going out with this thing and checking the soil where you're going to be planting these trees as opposed to waiting for one to die? There is, but I may not have the instrument before then. That would you might be able hard. to get Bob. He has one. Yeah, he has one. It's, it's, uh, I, think that, I think, you know, we're talking about 300 planting locations, so someone's going to have to collect the data. Yeah. Right now, I don't go to all 300 planting locations. I actually yeah. look at them via photos usually, or I select them. Mm -hmm. So d data collection will be. No, I, I, and I don't think I don't think the, the city staff will be collecting data just because of limited resources. But I do think this committee should think about the ramific the, how we formalize the ramifications against the gas company when our tree warden determines that the tree has been injured or died due to a gas leak. Yeah, yeah. That is really. I agree. Clear. So that I'm gonna. I'm going to have to wrap this up, unfortunately. Could I just say one more thing uh, before we get Pre move on? I think we not only, we, let me separate our weeds. I think the city not only collects the data, but we use it as an organizing tool. We make the data public and use it, use it as an organizing tool. Certainly, yes. Because so that's how we got this huge agree. change right. with the gas leaks that exist. We, I mean, we just raise a lot of ruckus. Absolutely, and that is within your bailiwick, and ours is to use it to further protect our tree canopy, and in as much as we can, share that good practice with other communities. 
So you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks everybody for coming. Rana, did you want to say anything? I mean, you were quiet most um, of the time. I, I don't have anything else okay. to say. Okay, all right, good. Um, and, but let's definitely keep the lines of unification open. As soon as we get the gas pit uh, sentry, we will, um, I'll let you know. And uh, I don't think we've got such a full Arbor Day, you know, mm -hmm. list of events that we probably won't be able to feature it this Arbor Day. But there's, you know, Arbor Day is not the only day to talk about trees. <laughs> and, and this is, you know, trees we've learned in the last five years of building this tree commission is hugely important to many, many Northampton residents. So I think that it can stand alone. And, and I think that we can make, grow some incredible public awareness out of this. And, um, and do some cutting edge, so to speak. Yeah, cutting, cutting edge, um, you know, just protection in a way that other communities are not looking at and probably y'all should have been a long time. Anyway, thank you guys for coming. You're welcome to stay for the next section of our meeting, which is about the ordinance, the draft ordinance. About it's ordinance. probably better Elliot's making the devil day, because I probably <laughs> You're hosting the ward, too. Well, I like the priorities. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> right. Anybody in ward, too? Yeah. Lily, this is also coming up on Monday, is it not? 7 o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the um, candidates. Love to have public. Uh -huh. Uh, turn out to that. Um, if you're so moved, it is 5 p.m. City Council Chambers. Legislative Committee of the City Council will be discussing this um, ordinance 18 dash like 321 or whatever it is. Yeah, 231. Uh, and that's about the 5 o'clock Monday? 5 o'clock Monday. Yeah? Okay? And whatever comes out of um, tonight, I'm happy to share with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank, Thank you all for you for making the effort. Appreciate you having you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Marty. Thanks for your work. Thank you. The Google Doc, or which, which draft ordinance, which ordinance are we talking about? So I believe the agenda is referring to 18.231. Is this not, this is not it? No. Oh, this is, do you have the picture yeah, No, that's the, that's the, that's the, formerly the tree impact permit. Oh, this will, is what you two worked yes, on. Yes, that's what Todd okay. and I worked on. Um, in the interest of, um, you know, time sensitive material, should we first talk about 18, Point two thirty one, and then circle back to this. Sure. Why don't you? Uh, so it, it it got approved, basically blessed by the planning board, and sent on to the city council and their various subcommittees. Yes, the legislative. So, so hold on a second. We're talking about the um, solar array. We are not yeah. talking about this. Right. Right. We're okay. talking about. Do we have a problem with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. okay. Do you wanna do you wanna look at the Google Doc version, Todd, where you I have inserted that. some comments? Yeah, I have I I permanently. And just for my personal information, because I don't totally I don't have like the best knowledge about how things move through whatever to mm -hmm. get finalized or whatever is happening. Um, so it came from the planning board, they voted on it. It came from the planning department. Yeah, I mean it was created by the planning Correct. department. Right. Went through to Alan Seawall. Yep. He gave it his uh, you know, stamp of approval in terms of legal. Yep. Then it went to the planning board, and okay. it just got approved by the planning. And board. now the next on Monday night is. It's the legislative subcommittee of um, city council. I don't okay. know if it goes to other subcommittees. Does it? Do you know, Rich? No, I don't know. Okay, thank you. And it's then obviously it's going to go in front of city council and as an ordinance. It needs two. It needs two sessions. Two readings. Um, two readings there. Mm -hmm. So April 8th would be the first of those two. So April 8th, 5 p.m., Council Chambers. So um, 
Okay, so in general, uh, I'm, just a bit, I'm not going to summarize it, I assume you read it. Um, but in general, I think uh, there are two categories of um, challenges with this ordinance. Um, number one, I, ca I can't find the original ordinance, eight, section 18 of the zoning code. It says to be it's reserved on the online zoning ordinance. Oh, wow. So I don't know if some of these questions or comments are moot or already answered. But my main, main concerns are, can be divided up between just overall ordinance writing and then how it relates to trees and the forests, which is really a prime concern. But related to that, the ordinance, as you can see, mentions a lot of zoning districts, but it doesn't mention all of the zoning districts, hmm. which I find odd. Um, so, Tell us where it says uses allowed. allowed by right, and then it says four, and then there's a bunch of letters. Those yeah. are all different zoning. Rural residential, suburban copy. residential, urban residential, A, B, C, and then. What's missing? Let's see. What's missing? Medical zoning district, plan village, highway business, uh, neighborhood business, entrance uh, business. Huh. Hmm. The other thing that is interesting in this is that it triggers a special permit in most residential districts for a uh, for project that is going to be uh, removing trees. But, hey, can you share specifically where that is? Well, so that is uh, the last uh, thing on page one says site plan approval required for the following uses by planning board. So, sorry, so of course, site plan approval by planning. By the planning board. Bottom of the first page, John. Mm -hmm. So that it says any. Oh, right here, site plan approval. Oh, oh, oh. Just so a site plan is needed for anything not mentioned above, and everything above is by right. Mm -hmm. So there's no, so you still have to get site plan approval if you are in the uh, general industrial zone and you want to build a solar facility that generates more than 200% of your estimated load. And then you have to adhere to these setbacks, which may or may not be relevant in your zoning district. So I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a little disconnect there, and I think we should, we should attempt to insert, as we've discussed with the planning department before, in, incentivizing more urban solar projects within the industrial zone, the office zone, um, highway business zone, what, whatever. Yes, you know, to that point, can I just read, um, I don't want to, I don't want to disrupt your train of thought, Todd, but it is related to it. Um, I, there, there were some comments that came from members of the public. One is Darcy Dumont, who is actually an Amherst City Councilor. Um, but it was echoed by Helen Armstrong, who is a Northampton resident. And what she said is, what is missing is reference to a master plan indicating priority for solar on buildings, parking lots, brownfields, mm -hmm. and or a limit to the percentage of land covered with ground-mounted solar mm -hmm. arrays. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in our master plan that speaks to this? I blessedly have not read our master plan since they're uh -huh. not enforceable documents that are master law. Yeah. Although, I mean, it does give it, I guess, a little gravitas if, if in an ordinance you're referring to a plan that, you know. Not really, legally speaking, not legally but maybe speaking. Politically. Okay. And then Bill Luma, who we know is this, you know, expert on um, protecting forests for, for climate change protection, um, said, I am surprised that there is no preferred citing language, although he may not have been able to interpret this alphabet soup, right? Because there actually is some preferred citing language? Well, the preferred is that it's by right uh -huh. if it's either under 12 kilowatts or under 200% of your annual projected electricity use right, okay. of the 
the size, the small thing size on the property. Okay. That's kind so of that's cheap. pretty limited. That's small. That's very limited. So what he goes on to say is, for example, installation on landfills, abandoned building sites, or other places previously disturbed, road right of ways over parking lots, and on stores or other large rooftops. So um, it sounds like this is echoed by a couple of people who think about this, um, and you mentioned it. Um, how how would how would that language be incorporated into this? You could broaden the by right uh, categories by either increasing and by increasing the size of the solar array if it that is by right if it meets certain criteria like it's uh, over a parking lot or on a brownfield or on a roof. You could write well. The first thing that's listed by right is rooftop solar, hot water, and photovoltaic. So any rooftop thing would get approved. You could just add that to say, or parking lots or brownfields. Yeah, but that, but those are those are just in the in residential districts. Oh. Well, okay. Then you could add that same statement under the the next. Okay. Um, Why is it limited to two percent for any yeah. zoning area? Is that something you could do? Is change that? So at least Most numbers backing up. Sorry, Molly. So there be the <laughs> residential. What is URA? Urban, urban residential, residential area. Suburban residential. Yeah. Urban yeah. residential. I've got a um, key here if you want to see it. WSP water supply yeah. protection. Yeah. Office industrial, general yeah. industrial, central yeah. business. Yeah, but they're missing yeah. highway business, yeah. neighborhood business, entrance yeah. business. All right, and you know, why don't you continue to talk with some of your right. broad concerns, and then we can try yeah. to get down into the weeds. Well, that's my main broad so concern, main broad concern um, is, is that, that the, just, I think it's missing a couple things, unless I'm missing something, because I can't find eight, section 18 online. Um, and then just just the rest of it is you know it, it, it seems fine in general i, I question um, a couple things um, and this is pretty consistent with the city zone code but uh, like on number one on page two where it says analysis showing tree removal which occurs blah 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 I'm a, I'm a big fan of saying who does the analysis? What certifications do they have? What are the what are the criteria for the analysis? Um, they have that for number two, but they don't have it for number one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and then, yeah, and then it, and it comes back to that. So I, uh, a number, over on number three, it does the same thing. It says the total total volume of trees to be removed provided by independent certified forester. Is that the same person that's doing the habitat analysis and the slope analysis? Is he consistent in identifying the criteria and the credentials for the analysis that you're, de you're depending upon? Uh, they list uh, don't cut down trees more than 100 years old. Okay. Is there a way to tell how old the tree is without cutting it down, cutting the springs? I mean, <laughs> no, I didn't think so. So that's weird. Or, yeah. Or you could do by size. There's a little tool that that you like yeah. hang from a board. So you got to do that for every big tree. Yeah. But, but, you know, but and then this you pull out. Nice but actually, the, um, the relevant, the age is not really relevant in terms Correct. of carbon sequestration. It's the size. Correct. So it shouldn't really be yeah. by age. Just, and it's so much easier to just say over a certain diameter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should so be EDH, not yeah. Yeah. Even, you are making a list of all these? Or? Yeah, Todd, you, you know, you're, you're our ordinance dude, so. You've made a list. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. And you are going to attend yeah. next yeah. Monday. I need you to attend next Monday, Todd. <laughs> She'll buy you dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Anything else that talking, you Molly. picked up, Todd? Because I know Molly has given this some thought. I've got some other comments from Bill and Uma. Uh, mention, uh, number 2A mentions thermal pools and then references the Conservation Commission. There are other uh, jurisdictions of the Conservation Commission that are not mentioned. So if you're going to mention one jurisdiction of the CONCOM, you should probably mention all of them, including streams and wetlands. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they introduced the word timber. I don't know if that's... Mm -hmm. uh, I 
yeah. defined in the zoning code. Um, I think maybe biomass would yeah, be something more appropriate. That I, that I Right. Where, 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 where is this timber again? It's on three. Oh, yeah. I, I was thinking live wood would be. And then live, again live on wood. C. C. Yeah. Is live wood a technical term, Molly? No, but it's a volume. You know, to calculate Bless volume. Excuse me. Bless you. And then D, kind of the mm -hmm. jumps of this whole section three, is, is basically an S. For you to sum up how much you cut down and then uh, calculate using short tons of carbon using something from the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science or other methodology after approved by the plan, uh, the permit grant authority, which is the plan board here. And then subtract the carbon offsets, short tons of carbon, provided by the solar photelic project over 10 years of operation. And I don't know if that's also according to the applied climate science or if, if there's a standard that you use to get that number. Uh, and then it says if, if it's upside down, the applicant shall assign RECs uh, to the city. Uh, RECs are no longer part of solar systems. Uh, it's all uh, through the SMART program and RECs are not included. So I don't, and I don't really understand how a transfer of RECs to the city would mitigate a carbon upside down carbon calculation, but I, I, I think so. This is kind of a cap and trade kind of uh, approach or a trade approach. It's a way to get free RECs, I guess. I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't find the logical nexus there, but um, so that, yeah, this whole calculation on three to me is needing problem moderate to significant work. I see. Okay. That was all from my initial run through. Good. Um, Molly, did you want to offer? Oh, I've got a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. Starting with the, um, the top of where it lists the um, setbacks where it says open space equals 20%. I wasn't sure what they meant. Does that mean that 20% of the of the property is supposed to be maintained as open space and not not developed? What do they mean by that? I don't know what they mean by that. There were not any questions because later it talked about the reference 50 is 50% as of number four. Right. So yeah, that it, down here on the back at number four, it says at least 50% of the property should be protected from tree clearing and development for the duration of the installation. But I don't know what this open space equals 20% is supposed to mean. Rich, any insight? No, don't have an answer for that, I'm sorry. Okay. I couldn't understand this. Well, that was, <laughs> was one like, thing. Whoa. All right, so I don't care so much about the buffer and all that. So. Um, Okay, then it, um, okay, more than three acres of removal, mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty big area. It uh, is, and Bill Muma's remark about that was, um, well, actually, he didn't refer directly to the three acres, but he did say the half parcel language would allow lots of small-scale clearings for panels. So he was concerned about this idea of um, only preserving 50% of the... Right. Yeah. Right. Like, well, so one of the general concerns I have about it, it doesn't talk anywhere about cumulative impact. I think you mentioned that. Like, um, how much percent total is our maximum level of our developable land that we're willing to put to solar? Or um, is there any limit um, of, you know... Huh. Any any upward limit, right? Cumulative. Yes. Right. Um, all right. So then, um, okay. So number one, the thing about one acre of slopes greater than twenty percent um, not causing erosion. Well, one acre is pretty big for you, you know you could have very significant erosion on less than an acre. So 
that seemed like a kind of arbitrary and high, and high. limit. Okay. Um, number two. And you say this as a conservation biology. Well, I don't, some, I'm some. not a specialist in erosion. Yes. So I'm not saying that as a specialist. I see. I'm just saying that as a regular person. Okay. Um, okay, number two, they talk about habitat. They don't ever define what they mean by habitat. So it's not clear if they're just talking about the trees and the plants and the plant community or whether they're talking about other features like mm -hmm. um, like cavity trees or, um, um, you know, rock piles that turkey vultures might nest in or, mm -hmm. you know, other kind of features, seeps or whatever. Um, there's a lot of other habitat features besides just trees. trees. Good point. So that, they never defined what they meant by habitat. Okay. Well, they did. Under A, B, and C, they do talk about vernal pools. So I see that they include vernal pools in what they're talking about. Is it possible that this being part of a larger ordinance, this is just one section of the Zoning, zoning Act 18? Is that right? Is that what I? That's what I right? assume. I mean, it's, so, it says it's, three, it's chapter 350, mm -hmm. section 18.231. Section 18 online is blank. So is it possible that all of these things are already defined and we just can't oh. see them? It is, but I doubt it. There are a lot of things defined, but some of the things are not defined, like timber. There's no definition of timber. Um, is habitat defined? That's a good question. I don't know. Okay. This analysis must include the structure and diversity of the canopy, um, which, again, are a little bit um, loose terms. I would say percent cover. Like in terms of structure, maybe you want person cover and size, um, size structure or something like that, and total volume. Um, you know, some specific way that you're actually measuring the structure. And diversity, um, are you talking about just species diversity or are you talking about also size and um, diversity of the mid-story and understory? Um, it's just kind of vague. Um, under A, I like that they said certifiable instead of certified. It leaves it. Um, Is it 2A or where are you? 2A. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Certifiable. But it, it's yeah. still, leave, so somebody's going to have to determine that it's certifiable, mm -hmm. which means you basically have to certify it except not submit the papers, collect all the data and everything. Um, but you you can't really ever prove that something's you can't prove that it's not a vernal pool all you can prove that it is a vernal pool it's a really weird line to have in the zoning bylaw frankly because the concom has their own triggers and if you trigger concom right. review you trigger concom review where there's not a zoning order and i remember that kind of came up the first the first draft that came before the um you know, at the meeting that I attended prior was people said, or Alan was uncomfortable with any language that created a redundancy of the laws that already existed, such mm -hmm. as wetlands protection. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's somewhat doing Maybe that. Maybe they could just, instead, just refer to the wetlands laws, whatever, you know, in, in A, instead of specifically talking about vernal pools. You know. mm -hmm. Vernal pools, well, Thing about vernal pools is they're not all actually considered wetlands. Mm -hmm. They're sometimes they're they're not big enough to be actually considered a wetland. That must be, but maybe that's why she yeah, put that in. Maybe yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, they're considering actually protecting, say, even just a small vernal pool that doesn't meet the size threshold or I see. Um, location like in a floodplain. I see that um, that it's a still wetland be, would be yeah okay. So that's good. I wasn't saying it said a permit from the CONSCOM based, so my question is based on what criteria? Um, that okay. doesn't say. Um, under B, it talks about clusters of five or more trees. Okay, so what do you mean by cluster? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. on the whole property Proximity. or like yeah. touching each other or, you know, do they have to be a certain distance apart to be considered clustered? Um, so that's vague. And so instead of 100 year old? I would say size over whatever size they're talking about. Um, 
morning. Well, when you read this, it almost can be interpreted as, well, if there's five or more trees that are next to each other that are 100 years old or more, where are you going to find that? Yeah, the thing is about the big trees, yeah. they're not usually in a cluster. Correct. They're usually they're sprinkled trees. around here right. and there. Exactly. A big tree over here, a big right. tree over there. Exactly. Because so, they were left. Exactly. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. And they're, they are valuable for sure because they can, um, they're more likely to develop cavities that animals can live in. Mm -hmm. And then when they eventually fall and are allowed to lie on the ground, they provide a lot of woody debris, which is ecologically beneficial. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no def sorry, there's no definition habitat, although it is referred to okay. zoning 350 attachment 4 as wildlife habitat, <laughs> where if developed conservation cluster designs encouraged. So there are like a few references, but as far yeah. as it, under definition, it's not defined. I guess you have to assume then that they're talking about the specific thing. They're talking about structure and diversity of the canopy, mid-story and understory. And a burnt poles, old trees, um, and that's it. Then the other one is about, C is about distribution and habitat. Um, so given that cluster is ill-defined and that's just going to snag anybody, what would you think is a reasonable geographic area that we could recommend where five or more trees of X size shall be preserved in order to fix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, I, what I like about this draft is that they are trying to create all of these thresholds Mm -hmm. You know, beyond which, if you you mm -hmm. you might you know if you right. if you pass, the project's off. Mm -hmm. And I, I so I want to support that, but I don't want to make it impossible to yeah. interpret that that you know we get ourselves in trouble. I I have to say, one member of the planning board even said, I'm actually surprised that Alan approved this. Mm -hmm because it's got so many vague things in it? Yeah, and that it really targets solar construction. I mean, if we were to apply this to any conversion, mm -hmm. any land conversion, such as to residential development or whatever, would right. we be able to get away with this? Right. So to me, it actually- Building houses, for example. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh, good point. Okay, do you have, what else do you have? Um, Okay, on C, okay, so, so they want a, like a landscape analysis, I guess, of if this is, for example, a rare plant community or an unusual kind of, there's something unusual about this compared to the surrounding area. Um, so, okay, that's, that seems reasonable to me. Show that it's not fragmented and that it mm -hmm. has connectivity that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, under three, the total volume of trees. Oh, oh yeah, okay. So they're talking about carbon neutral. They're measuring the amount of volume of trees to be removed, but they should also consider the volume that would have been expected from new growth mm. in the next 10 years oh, wow. of both those trees that are removed. Mm. Um, it's such a good Especially point. those ones, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, yeah, easy, you know, that's, that's really easily really predictable. Yeah, it, it, it with is. Like, There's all uh, kinds of models. Yeah, on um, right. eye tree. That's what forest that is like that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Eye tree, wow. you could go, anyone could go on. Because that's the tree actively sequestering, you know, exactly. over the 10 years, yes. not just what it already has sequestered. It's a really wow. good point. And plus, another thing that's maybe even more complicated, like then after the end of the 10 years, those all those trees are bigger, they're gonna be sequestering even more in the next 10 years, yeah. compared to if you cut them down yeah. and start over again. Right. So there's there's an exponential curve there. Yeah. Why 10 years? Because like because the, um, they're analyzing the um, solar output of the panels over 10 years. 10 years. So you're just comparing 
apples to apples in this. Mm -hmm. um, so, I hope, Molly, you can put all these comments in kind of an articulable form, and will you be able to show up at the meeting on Monday? Um, Because I think that point is a really that's interesting great. one. That's a that's a really significant one. The clock doesn't, you know, kind of stop ticking the minute you tick, cut down the tree. Mm -hmm. um, I have do. I have a book group. I have to skip it, but I didn't like the book anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can recommend a better one. How about trees. <laughs> um, all right, I'll do that. Okay, great. Anything else, Molly? Yes. Sorry, um, no, sorry. On the last page, see conversion of the net timber. Mm -hmm. So that's that question, timber again. Timber. Mm -hmm. um, I think it should just say mm -hmm. live wood. Live wood. Mm -hmm. And and so not only like timber only includes when a forestry uses that word timber, they're just talking about um, high quality logs. Yes. And the whole tops and branches mm -hmm. aren't, aren't counted at all. Uh huh. Um, but that, yeah, that, that's not the way to do it if you're talking about carbon. Um, let's see. Okay, and the last one, number five. Why does it say, um, so they're talking about leaving stumps except where it's required to bore the support posts for the PV panels? But um, um, why wouldn't you want to just leave the stumps everywhere. Why are you excluding the first three acres? I don't know. And not leaving, um, and allowing stumps to be removed from that. Todd, do you think about that one? No. Within, let's just read that again. This is number five. Within the area beyond the first three acres of canopy removed. In other words, the first three acres of canopy removed just gets a gold Anything pass. goes. Yeah. And then beyond that, again, I think it brings back the issue of like three acres is. Didn't it come up that that was so leaving the stumps in would be impossible? For, like, or it would make it not worth your effort to develop. So they, are they reining in the development to three acres, saying, okay, three acres, you can do it, but mm, then after that, that we're going to make it so it's not really worth Basically worth it making it affordable. Making yeah. it yeah. financially feasible. Right. For three acres, but after that they're making it mm -hmm. so it's really not hard. as Yeah. Hmm. But I still say for this purpose, why exclude the first three acres? I mean there is in this there's a, an acknowledgement that the impact mm -hmm. is going to be greater with greater than three acres. So why not try to mitigate that impact in as many ways as possible? Cool. Yeah. Because anything under three acres you don't have to submit any of this. You don't submit any right. of it, but if you are submitting it because you are going over three acres, then is it wrong for them to go? And by the way, those other three acres, we're going to ask you to keep the stumps. Like, would that be illegal, Tom? I'm no lawyer. Can we go See, back up to the calculation <coughs> for a second? Sorry. The what? Uh, the calculation on under three. Yeah. If. Mm -hmm. Page two. Yeah. So you're taking today's timber, right? Tree, wood. Today's yeah. wood. Today's wood. Yeah. And you're converting today's wood to short tons of carbon. That's what they're doing. That's what they're saying. And do you do that for? Is that a year's worth? A day's? What is? What well, is the time frame? Well, there's a certain amount of carbon that's stored in that wood. It's not a time frame. It's just like. So it's the existing carbon that is within the wood. Mm -hmm. That's my okay. understanding. Yeah. All right. And then you're comparing that to 10 years of solar generation. Mm -hmm. Right, but they, what they should also include is the, the, um, the, with the, the carbon that would be sequestered over those 10 years by the trees as opposed to right. being pulled in by the And do you do that by estimating, as you said before, just one, do you do that by estimating the total biomass in 10 years? Yes, you can estimate growth rates of trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, foresters do that all the time. Mm -hmm. 
and there's no and ongoing it's... carbon uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere. It's it's just it's just it's just there based on its volume. Well, the the wood is carbon. Right. It's basically that. made of carbon. So then as the tree grows and adds more wood, it's taking carbon out of the air and over a time period. Okay. So it really should be, what is the volume at year 10? Yes, yeah. and then convert that into carbon. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. I just need mm -hmm. to understand yeah. it. Yeah. Right. That's right. That's right. right. I mean, just the yeah, other. That's, that's right. That's you, volume at year 10. Yeah, that's a good way right. to put it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this would never get in there, but if you're allowing them to, if you're allowing to rip out the stumps, which is going to churn up the, um, churn up the soil, there's even more carbon loss. Right, that's, that's why this whole thing yeah. about the stumps is in there. Yeah, yeah. it may be, I don't know enough stumps. about construction or logging that, um, construct that, I mean, maybe that's a, like they have to have, like a you know, landings to skid the logs out. And I mean, I just don't know enough about that. Yeah, there's probably going to be more destruction just of, certainly on the soil just to get equipment. I mean, it's just the point, you know, that's being mm -hmm. you know, overlooked, mm -hmm. plus the, all the other stuff that trees do besides just carbon. I mean, this is strictly carbon. My problem with arguments in the back and forth right. in the newspaper and stuff, all they're saying is, Trees this much yeah. carbon, soil well, this much carbon. Can I? Well, they have, they have, I think number two is supposed no. to be an attempt to more. look at those ecological factors. There is, but Bill Luma addresses that a bit too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what he says is it is important to add more so solar. Okay, wait, no, that's not the part. Um, Trees are more than star carbon storage units. They reduce local temperatures in summer by shading streets from absorbing more sunlight and radiating heat. More importantly, evaporation of water from leaves can keep surrounding areas several degrees cooler, reduce the demand for air conditioning and the emissions associated with the electricity generation to operate them. If they want equivalencies, they should include this factor when accounting for trees removed for solar arrays. So, to me, that last sentence, I get really snagged on that. Mm -hmm. Because, um, I, so for me, it's all about quantifying. Okay, how do you quantify the equivalence? Yeah, if you can't point us to a, if, if you can't Here point us to a study with a formula. Exactly, I so I did it. ask him for that. Because, uh, that, you know, these things need to be quantified. And if we could layer on additional benefits that trees serve to the climate besides carbon sequestration, in some kind of formula, to the, you know, to the approval process, that would be super valuable. But if he's just talking in generalities, it's not helpful. The all. only, I mean, I don't know how you would like transfer this into a document like this, but you can go on iTree Suites. Yeah, it's free, the USDA mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. and you can type in this is my type of tree. Here's the DDH, and it will give you tabs of this is how much particulates, this is how much CO2, this is how much um, stormwater mitigation, this is how much you know. It gives you specific values for yeah. each one of those. Mm -hmm. The easiest one is if you Google Davy Tree Benefit Calculator. That's the easiest one to access. They and and literally you just type it in, type it in there, and it spits yeah. out. But I don't know. It's all the same calculator. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That one's the easiest. I, I, mm -hmm. It's the easiest to like get in. Yeah. You know? So you're saying if it's saving energy, then that has an impact on carbon. You know, I, I suppose it depends somewhat where, how proximate it is to, you know, or to human settlements where people would need to benefit from that cooling. So, um, you know, that, that brings in another layer of, you know, the, the iTree calculator is all based on averages, mm -hmm. so at least it's something to go on, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not going to be site specific. It's not going to... Right. Oh, yeah. Well, let, well, that's all about it. Speaking of stormwater, who calculates the stormwater fee based on uh, impervious surface? ground mounted solar rays count as impervious surface? And if not, how are they any different from my driveway, which sheds water to 
I don't know. That's a good question. I would think they would be counted. Yeah. Hmm. Well, technically, the soil and the is not a purpose. <laughs> but technically, the soil under my house, eventually, if you get down deep enough, yeah. is in a purpose. Well, I have a gravel driveway, and they say that's a yeah. Now, you have the brick walkway, they say. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the fact that, I mean, I think I remember, again, Carolyn, in the first meeting I went to, addressing that all of this already has to go, it has to fly past the stormwater. Uh, manager, from auto management, uh, and that you know, so so that's a given. That's already a given. But so but if it was I on a slope really or question. something like that, of a certain percent. Yeah, but I think it's a it's a really important question because you're exactly right, Todd. Even though there's per pervious permeable ground underneath, if it's shedding dramatically enough, you know that that huge surface area. It's going to cause runoff. It's going to. It's all going to come gonna, down into one sort of trench yeah, where all the water's going to go. Yeah. Riverbed, and then yeah, exactly. join the other one. That's and, a really yeah. good point. Depending on how the layout, like if they have one big sheet like that that all comes down, or if you have several different ones. No, like just that. if you've seen a, a big solar facility, yeah. I mean they're not without access, mm -hmm. and they'll have you know roads within them that right. they can get right. to. That's right. There's all that too. And uh, yeah, and I do want to just get on record and applaud the planning department for tackling this issue, which is really given to us by very poorly thought out uh, Massachusetts general law. Um, so this is a, a, a tricky thing that really should have been dealt with, frankly, by DOER and <coughs> possibly the legislature. So have called making towns jump through these hoops to do something that the regulations at the state level should have already done uh, is uh, typical of trickle-down um, That's why I, I calculated approximately what the size would be of a 12 kilowatt break, because I had no idea. Yeah. It's approximately 26 by 26 feet. Okay. Mm, uh, how, what does that relate to? Um, really really that's the maximum yeah. size here that they talk about. Oh, oh, I see. It's like two, it's like two point whatever normal rooftop systems. Most rooftop systems are five to six. Um, so it's a pretty small, it's a small area. It's, it's like the size of the stage, more or yeah. less. So then it, yeah, it jumps from that up to three acres. Well, everything, everything that's under three acres but over that 12 kilowatts is completely unregulated. Wait, is that right? Um, oh, I guess you just can't do it. Yeah, what happens? What wait, happens? Yeah, I'm a little confused geez. about things that are over the 12 kilowatts, which is a very small area, but under three acres, which is a big area. What if it's a, like a one acre or a two acre? What does that fall? I'm not clear. Like, no, I no, I, I share your confusion, which is why I was trying to find the original ordinance to see if it became more clear than oh. the original ordinance. But um, I'll stop talking. Um, what are our next steps here, folks? I feel like us bringing this mishmash of a million different thoughts and um, concerns that we have in front of the legislative committee. Okay, so what, what's, what do you recommend, Todd? <laughs> well, even though it's a mishmash, it's, there's a lot of questions that we just raised. So even if we don't have answers, should we, we have a lot of legitimate questions. That should we write a letter? Answer. Should we submit a letter that's the tree commission as well, a whole? I'll remind you, this is why we made a specific recommendation that we be you know, asked to be involved in the process prior to it getting back to the planning commission, which right. didn't happen. Questions really need to be answered by the planning board or by planning. I think personally. The planning board wrote it. 
right. yeah. Council's not yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think the legislative committee is going to answer the questions. They are just going to look perplexed and maybe ask planning questions. But I think. It's almost like you have to draft a letter. In a sense, you have to draft a letter to. I'm not really sure if you would draft a letter to Bill Dwight. No, who's the president of the council? Not Bill Dwight. Where was the president of the council? Isn't it still Ryan? It's Ryan O'Donnell, I think. You, in a sense, and or go to the the public hearing and actually have a document drafted, a letter drafted, stating that these are our questions and concerns about this particular document that were not answered uh, or we would like to have answered before you consider moving this proposed ordinance forward. Um, or you could do the other thing is send an email to Carolyn and ask her to answer the questions and see if you can get some of the questions answered before you know, It's Wednesday. I understand that. That doesn't feel reasonable. I have, you know, I have a job. Oh, everybody has um, jobs. I know. Everybody's got stuff to do. I, I understand. <laughs> I understand. I don't. I, you know, it's almost like it's got to be re-looked at again. But I, I think, it's, I don't know, the word "rush to judgment" is yeah, it's not really I, fitting. But "rush to something" would be fitting. I think. Well, we would have been happy to have had a conversation, and I, so it feels like it was an unfortunate thing that this that we weren't included in some of this drafting. Um, do you want to work together on a letter summarizing some of these concerns? I'll, I'll be, I'm, I'm not, no, not really, because the letter goes This was challenging to review because I don't think it should, ever should have been in front of the planning commission, if I'm being honest. Because? It, it's not ready. It, 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 just by evidence of the last 25 minutes of yeah. our... And yet they, the planning board made no, no specific comments about any of these line items. They didn't go through it line by line. I mean, there was one person who said, this thing is so dense, I would never know how to interpret this. It's very, it's very complicated. I mean, I'm having a hard time myself wrapping my head around it. So I think it's complicated for someone who doesn't do this for a living. Mm -hmm. And look at all the comments that you've made that have come from different um, professions yeah. that you all have. Right. So I think that that's yeah. kind of, and I'm not saying anything about the planning board, they're, they're fine people, but it's just, it's a document that it's, was put in front of them. It's that, lacking some expertise. I think the most uh, appropriate, respectful thing to do is to ask for a meeting with the planning department to go over our questions and concerns. Okay. And to perhaps give them a heads up that, you know, we have a fairly significant amount of questions and concerns that we prefer to deal with As opposed to in front of the city council, mm -hmm. which in my view is not the appropriate place for staff and an advisory body to be mm -hmm. right. throwing stuff around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if, if we go to the city council, we're it, relegated to the general public. Is that I'll be honest, I don't think it's our people. place to go to the city council. We, we, we advise the mayor, and this is a, a, a staff which mm -hmm. works for the mayor's mm -hmm. initiative, and mm -hmm. I think we need to deal with it mm -hmm. in that manner. Okay. Um, again, it being Wednesday, I think it's highly unlikely that they're going to be able to meet with us in the next two days, and that we will have, um, that we will oh, all we should, find it. We need to ask day. for a meeting sometime on Monday. Uh, Rich, would you like to be part of that as well? And I think that it would be helpful to have you there. 
especially if you have questions and concerns. I'll be honest with you, it's very complicated. I find it to be extremely compl complicated. I'm on the Energy Sustainability Commission and I struggle because it's a very com there are so many complex mm -hmm. issues that yeah. I don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I'm still trying to learn disease, names of diseases of trees, you know, and I'm so, right. it's just, a, it's, it's very complicated. And you know, you have to rely upon um, the expertise of others to actually craft this kind of document. Mm -hmm. That's sense. the problem. Right. And I'm, and I'm uh, again, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know where all the language came from. You know, I, I know that Carolyn did think quite a bit about it, and she did talk to people, and of course, and then Alan in the end has basically, you know, gone through the document and made the final adjustment adjustments that he thinks are appropriate. But there's obviously a whole bunch of questions that are not uh, answered. I think it would be good to, when you, if you're going to request a meeting, that you actually send along a series of questions so Carolyn has time to look at them mm -hmm. and actually formulate answers instead of asking for all the answers on Monday and then mm -hmm. Carolyn scrambling right. and, or someone's mm -hmm. scrambling and saying, I can't, I can't get back to you yeah. in, in a timely right. manner. And then the, whatever happens from that, if something happens, wonderful. If nothing happens, then it goes and continues the march forward. Mm -hmm. But I agree with Todd. I think going in front of city council is probably not appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, will you please write up, or anybody else, uh, Marilyn, we didn't hear from you, but I, I, um, I figured you would have chimed in if you had something that you wanted to add. Yeah, admittedly, I didn't read this before the meeting, so um, I missed that somehow. So I'm just looking at it as we were discussing. Okay. Um, well, if you could write I up. I could either um, write up like the bullet points of what my points are. Yeah. Is that enough? Yeah, that's helpful. Or I could get together with you and help write a letter. Maybe it's easier to just no, I think one person the write a letter. Points and um, Todd, if you do the same, then I feel like um, you and I can co draft a, an email to Carolyn, which you should probably write tomorrow. And. Um, and request a meeting for her on Monday. What is your Monday looking like? Uh, Monday is fine. My tomorrow and the rest of the day is fine. Huh. Okay. Do you have time to write up some bullet points at least? Yes. Okay. Maybe tonight. I'll just send them on. To you. All right. Well, that took us to six thirty. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Wow. Um, I hate to say this, folks. We have a decision to make. We can either go over our uh, meeting or we can table the rest of the meeting for the next week. What else do we have? I have the Can I make a motion that we table? Second. <laughs> You're really on the fence there. Um, <laughs> I would just ask, okay, so this is the discussion part of we have a motion and we have a second. Um, do we have any issue here that must be discussed before the next meeting on the 17th? So we have another meeting before our meeting. We have the 17th. Right. Yeah, in and which we were going to do some letter writing. Yep, I just will have to change the, uh, the dates. The dates. They're all right. Oh, we were hoping that we were going to be able to do that. So, all right. Oh, sorry. Why did you just change the date? Yeah, we'll, we'll change the dates on the mail merge. Oh, that's a tree right there. It's that's not a big easy. deal. Please. Look more Recycle. Recycle. Wait, what are you doing? You're adding okay. what to the letter? We're no, changing, we're the, changing date. the date because yeah. it's dated for today. Landscape um, letter. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you wanted each of us to us to just sign, sign them? Yeah, that wasn't on the agenda today, but that's okay. We really tried said you would try to squeeze it in. I tried to squeeze it in. Yeah. Um, well, uh, do you just I need me to sign them? Or is this where we're writing little this handwritten little notes? Little handwritten notes. Yeah. So the 17th is fine. That gives us plenty of time to send these out to people. I mean, mm -hmm. this is something yeah. that we just coincide with Arbor Day. Yeah. We can send it's it any time, actually. Okay. Hard day. All right. okay. All in favor, then? Aye. Aye. All right. This meeting is adjourned. Um,